My name is Don Dodge, and I'm the summer interim pastor while Pastor Jeremy and Adrian are taking the summer off. Did everybody get that prayer card last week and it's in your bulletin again? All right. Just ask that you put that somewhere, that you pray for them. Put it on your mirror, your dash, or something like that. Actually, before we get started, would you mind praying with me? Let's go to God. God, we thank you that we are able to worship together this morning. It's your day. Every day is your day, and we are your family. And so, Lord, we want to just say thank you, and God, that your presence would be uh, so felt today that you would be speaking to hearts. And Lord, we lift up Pastor Jeremy and ask for healing. God, we ask that you help him so that when he comes back, that he is refreshed and ready to go. We love you and we trust you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, now we are in a summer series called Unexpected Stories, where we've been looking at stories in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, kind of seeing uh, what kind of God uh, that we serve and finding out that the God of the Old Testament really is not what most of us thought, but that he is the same God as the God in the New Testament which is such a shock to so many of us. You know, two weeks ago, we looked at Hezekiah's messed up Passover and how everybody screwed everything up. Yet, because they were seeking God with their whole heart, they were reconciling with each other, it says that he healed them. He was okay, even though they were messing it all up pretty bad. And then last week, we saw Jesus allowing a prostitute or a sinful woman to wash his feet with her tears and her hair to the absolute... um, Amazement is not probably the right word because it was a negative amazement to the disgust of all of those around who just couldn't believe what was going on. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at a story in the Old Testament and kind of contrast it with a story in the New Testament. And um, kind of one of the things you're going to find throughout this whole series is we're going to bounce back and forth. And because the goal of that is I really do want to help break the tendency that so many of us have, that the Old Testament God is evil or mean and judgmental, and the New Testament God is one of of love and who is good. I'm hoping that we get a fresh look at the Bible um, and that we can let the Old Testament speak in a new way. It's so easy to misinterpret what's happening because the farther you go back in history, the more the culture is different. And, um, you know, kind of show you an example of that. I I found this... uh, this thing, several kids were asked, you know, what about their Bible knowledge, and they were asked some questions. Their responses are enlightening and humorous, and maybe semi, um, um, not appropriate, but that's okay, because we're all big boys and girls, and we can handle it, right? All right, so what was the first commandment? One of the kids said, obviously, when Eve told Adam to eat the apple, <laughs> I mean, she ate it, and she's like, you will eat this, son. And he's like, yes, ma'am, you know, and he ate the apple. And then the seventh commandment, what is it? Thou shalt not admit adultery. (laughs) Isn't that great? (laughs) I think they missed one key word. What is unleavened bread? Without a doubt, it is bread without any ingredients, of course. No calories, no taste, nothing. All right, what does the golden rule say? Do one to others before they do one to you. (laughs) You know, you wonder, you're like, whatever kid said that, you think, yeah, his childhood's gonna be very different (laughs) than what he's been taught. All right, now this one cracks me up. Who were the enemy of the Jews? Those heartless genitals. I really think he meant Gentiles, but that one's funny. And then the last one. So if polygamy is having many wives, one wife is called monotony. (laughs) Yeah, great. I mean, these are real. This is really what kids said. And so you you see that, and and it just, it it kind of, it cracks me up. And I just realized that that slide is going to be up for a little while, which is probably not the greatest thing in the world because if somebody puts that on their phone, they'll be like, no. I, I, so, um, yeah, maybe we should just black that out. <laughs> slide. Because it just dawned on me how far it is until the next one. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. All right. I know I keep saying it, but the, the Bible is so easy to misinterpret because it was written 
in so many different cultures so long ago. I mean, Moses, who we're going to start with today, lived 3,500 years ago. I mean, that is, there's some crazy disconnects in culture when you start going back, you know, 100 years ago, let alone 3,500 years ago. And, um, you know, when you think about it, the Old Testament was ri- written in an Eastern culture. You know, even today, modern day, if you went to India, China, Afghanistan, you are going to find that the culture is so different it's unrecognizable to you. You're not going to understand it at all. And that's modern. Imagine that culture way back then. And, of course, the New Testament was written kind of in the Mediterranean to a Greek and a Roman culture. That's the foundations of our culture. So it is a lot more understandable. And it's, you read stories and you, you get it a little bit more emotionally. You're like, oh, I like that and I don't like that. And it feels right. It's because that's our foundations. <laughs> but the older I get, the more I relate to the Old Testament because it has some amazing stories, some unexpected stories. You know, you have stories of normal people trying to figure out how to live life. And they mess up a lot. And I love that because it makes me feel a little bit better about myself. The Old Testament is so full of like heroes and sinners. And usually those are the same people. I love that. People struggling to do with, you know, do what's right. Struggling with questions about why does bad stuff happen to good people and good stuff happen to bad people all the time? And God, why do you do what you do? And what are you like? And just questions that I struggle with. And the Old Testament also does something that I think a lot of us need. It helps us see how big God is. I mean, to the Old Testament characters, God is incomprehensible unfathomable in every three and four syllable words you could come up with. God is big. He's ginormous. I love that word. (laughs) Yes. Thank you. Now, when God became a man in Jesus, what did we learn about God? We, We learned how to call him Abba or Daddy. We, we sing now songs like, what a, I am a friend of God. And we have this comfortable, casual relationship with God, and that is good. God is a God who pursues us and loves us. He, he, he knows us and wants to be known by us, and that is so beautiful. But see, the Old Testament still reminds us that God is actually bigger than we could ever know. He is unfathomable and ginormous. So this, is the, this verse right here made total sense to the Old Testament characters, that God sits on throne above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers because they got it. God is big and I am small and if he wanted to, he could crush me like a bug. But thank God he doesn't. But instead he has a plan and a purpose. His story is epic. My story is probably but a sentence. No, a comma in his story. Yet each one of us tries to live our individual lives like it is the most important story. That my story is the main story. I'm the star. I'm concerned with my story. You're concerned with your story. And it's hard to grasp that the story, the, capital T, the story, it's not even about us. It's about him, that God is the star of the story. And seriously, that is something that we can be so thankful for. It's not about me. You know, something good happens when we realize that there's a story that is so much bigger than us, and it's been going on so much longer than before you and I arrived on this planet. And it's a story that's going to go on long after we're gone. See, the the Bible describes this infinitely big story, a God story all around us. And here's what blows me away. You and I appear on every page. Why? I don't know. But long before you and I were ever even conceived, God had a purpose for you and for me in this epic story. We're given a choice. We can cling to our little local infomercial, which you've seen those on TV, and they're just embarrassing. Just embarrassing. Or we can be a part of a timeless Academy Award-winning worthy epic. As long as we remember he is the star. He allows us to, imp- I mean, think about this. If the story's about me, 
I want to make a lot of money, have a lot of comfort, and do a lot of, you know, just enjoy life now. Who cares about you, right? It's about me. My story is about me. But if the story is about God, you and I now have purpose, and we get to impact eternity. It's not just about me and my life and my comfort, because in fact, being a part of God's story, I might suffer a little bit or a lot, but my life impacts eternity. It impacts everybody in my circle of influence throughout my whole life. That's pretty amazing. We are offered a story that doesn't end when we die. That's amazing. Because if the story is about me, if I'm lucky, it's going to be a 70, 80 year story. But if it's about God, how long is the story going to last? Forever. That's pretty amazing. That is pretty amazing. So we can accept God's invitation of a role in his timeless epic. Or we can say, no, I want it to be about me. And that's really empty. So that's the story we were created for, his story. And that's the one we're introduced in the Old Testament. So, you know, overview, just kind of a little bit of perspective. God creates Adam and Eve. They sinned. He doesn't abandon them. Instead, he provides for them, and he continues the relationship. And then just 12 chapters later, in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham comes on the scene. God tells him that it is through your descendants, I want the world to be blessed. But what's weird is for the next several, you know, 20, 30 chapters, you see this story of Abraham and his descendants, and Genesis ends with Abraham's descendants going into slavery. And they are called the Hebrews at this point. And they're in slavery for like hundreds of years. That's how Exodus, the second book of the Bible, starts. You're, and you're like, from Genesis chapter 50 to Exodus chapter 1, there's nothing there. It's just, you know, it's in your Bible and it's like a continuation. Yet 400 years passes and they're in slavery. You're like, that stinks. That is not a fun part of the story. And that's exactly where we start today. They were slaves. You think about it. For hundreds of years. I mean, America is what, 200 and sort of years old? Right. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not old at all. They were in slavery longer than our country has existed. Where was God? You know, they didn't even remember Abraham. It was so long ago. They, who could remember that? They, they just wanted relief from slavery, you know? And so they're, they're wondering, what this God that talk to our father Abraham, you know, 20 generations ago. Where has he been? Where is he? And then all of a sudden, enter Moses. You have this Hebrew baby that is adopted into Pharaoh's family. And as a young man, he ends up killing an Egyptian slave driver. So the Egyptian slave driver is, you know, abusing Hebrews. Moses gets mad, kills the guy. Everybody finds out and he flees to the desert to escape the death penalty. Decades pass where Moses is in the desert. He becomes a shepherd for his father-in-law's sheep. That's his life. Pinnacle to the bottom. And as an old man, there's Moses in the desert shepherding his father-in-law's sheep when he notices a bush on fire. You've probably seen the burning bush scene in a movie. This is the prince of Egypt, although I'm not sure if you can see him down in the bottom left, but he's there and this is like one of the pivotal scenes in the story. Moses stops to investigate the bush. God speaks through the bush calling his name, Moses. And I doubt God has the high-pitched voice I have. Um, maybe we can turn up the bass, I'm not sure, but you know, Moses or something, I don't know. And Moses responds probably with a much more high-pitched voice, here I am, and I'm just kidding, here I am. And God explains the plan. Okay, here, Moses, you're going to be my instrument to rescue my people, the Hebrews, from the Egyptians. They think, I, they think I have forgotten them, but I haven't. But Moses sees himself as what? He's been a shepherd for decades. This is all he is. And so this is what he says. He says, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? That is such a great question. And it's one that every one of us in this room ask all the time. Who am I? Am I qualified? Do I measure up? Am I valuable? And what's amazing is I love how God answers this question. Who am I, God? 
And God says, I will be with you. Who am I? I will be with you. Hmm. See, it doesn't matter who you are, Moses. It doesn't matter what gifts or talents you have or lack. I will be with you. Moses, it's my story. Don, insert your name here. It's my story. No matter who you are, you have a role in the story. See, God plus you is more than enough. Who am I? You're mine. I'm with you. It's about a relationship. I'm with you. It's more than enough. And like us, Moses wasn't convinced. So he is the first person in history to ever card God. Love it. He's like, Moses said to God, okay, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? I need your name, God. Give me something. You know, I, you've been silent for like 400 years. I've been gone for 40 or so years. Who is going to believe this? Hey, guys, I was in the desert with some sheep. Bush didn't burn up. Talked to me, said, hey, let's go out of Egypt. And everybody's thinking, yeah, Pharaoh's going to kill us. They're going to need some proof, God, that I'm not crazy. Who do I say that you are? See, for hundreds of years, God has been distant, separate, and forgotten. But what does God say to Moses? I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. So what is God's name? God's name is I am. See, God was telling Moses, I am the center of everything. I am all you need. I am the creator. I'm the one who made you. I'm the one who loved you. And I am the one who is calling you. God is saying, I am the one who has not forgotten you or your people. I am more than enough. I am God. You're God. I'm not distant. I am near. And I am the star of the story. And I'm inviting you to join me. I am. Now, what's really cool is in that exact moment when God reveals his name, Moses' name is suddenly known as well. Because in that instant, who am I? Well, if God is I am, Moses' name must be I am not. I am not. I'm not the center of everything. I'm not in control. I'm not calling the shots. I'm not the creator. I'm not the sustainer. I'm not God. See, when God revealed his name, he revealed ours. God's name, I am. My name, I am not. I am not. Would you say that with me? I am not. One more time. I am not. This is such a powerful name, and it's so freeing because I'm not holding it all together, but guess what? I'm not expected to. So many of us, we're trying to hold it all together. We're trying to be everything that everybody is expecting us to be. And God is saying, but you're not. You're not expected to do that. I am not. I'm not perfect. I can't be. You know, once we recognize the fact that we can't be perfect, it makes it so much easier when we fail. I'm not whole. I'm not complete. I need God's help. I need the I am. I'm not the star of the story, but I know who is, and he invites me to participate with him because it's his epic story. God is I am. He is the one calling the shots. He is the one for making sure that everything works out okay. It's his responsibility it, for everything to work okay and to end well. All I'm required to do is follow him, to be faithful, to allowing him to be the star. That is so freeing. See, God doesn't need us, yet he still desires us. Amazing. He is choosing to include us in a story that we don't have to be a part of, but he wants us to be a part of it. It's his story. You know the Lord's Prayer where it says, his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's his story. His power, which will reign long after the powers of this world are gone. It's his story. He's the one who paid the price to include us in the story. 
He must get the spotlight. It's a common theme throughout the Old Testament. God is big. He is so big. He is God. It's all about him, not me. At the end of his life, Moses gave the Hebrews the Shema. These are the words that would guide the Israelites even to this day. Shema Israel, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Huh, I've heard this before on the lips of Jesus. He said, this is the greatest commandment that goes all the way back to Moses. 1,500 years earlier, love God most, put him first. He is the I am. The story is about him. He needs to be on center stage. See, live your story in light of his story. Allow your story to be defined by his story. That's what he's saying. Such a powerful message because this is where true life is. It's not an easy life. He never promises your story is going to be one of comfort and success. It could be pain and suffering. It could be. But true life is going to be found in his story. This was such a powerful message for the Hebrews, but they failed over and over. And before we slap them on the wrist and say, man, I know they kept failing. Look at your life too (laughs) and my life too, because I keep failing over and over. I want to make him the star of the story. I, I say I'm making him star of the story, and then I continually try to make the story about me and my life. God, I love you. It's all about you, but I want to go this way. So why don't you join me and bless me, and we'll keep walking this way. Who does, I mean, I can't be the only one. I heard a couple of, like, awkward laughs, so I know that other people are like, get off my feet. The entire Bible is full of stories of people going back and forth, putting God first, then putting themselves first, and going back and forth. And in the process, we do keep missing out on life and purpose, opportunities to be a part of something meaningful. So, that's the Old Testament side. I want to jump to a New Testament story that kind of fleshes this out kind of contrast them. Now, in the New Testament, there is this guy who is probably not your best dinner guest. His name is John the Baptist. He was kind of like in your face. He was harsh. He always pointed out all of the faults, you know, all around. And um, John was on the scene right before Jesus. He was proclaiming that the Messiah was going to come. Now, the Messiah was the He was the guy who the Jews had been expecting to come and deliver them from Roman oppression or from Persian oppression or from whoever. They were always oppressed by somebody. And they were praying for this Messiah to come and deliver them. They were expecting him at any time to come and deliver him, deliver them. And so then John is saying, this guy is coming. And they kept asking him, are you him? Because you seem to know a lot about this Messiah. Are you the Messiah? No, I'm not. But then Jesus comes on the scene. And even Jesus was baptized by John. As John's baptizing in the wilderness, all these people, he even baptized Jesus. It really seemed like John had reached his moment. I mean, he was kind of, he was on the rise. He was successful. He was, it was his time in the spotlight. But then, as Jesus started his ministry, it didn't take long for all of the crowds to stop following the guy who's baptizing and start following the guy who's healing people and raising from the dead. That's fair. You know, you're like, that. Eh. Baptism's cool, but (laughs) I got this, you know, I can't see. I'm going to follow the guy who made me see. We get it. So one day, John's the man. The next day, all attention's on Jesus. And so some of John's disciples are complaining. They're like, you know, why is everybody following him? What about us? We were, you know, come on. everybody." And John, he knew his name. I am not. I am not. When it, it came time to either be the star of the show, or shine the light on the real star, John immediately directed the attention to Jesus, and he said some words that pierced my soul. Because John, in the midst of this, said, he, Jesus, must become greater. I must become less. Let that sink in. He must become greater. I must become less. Who says that? Think about it. No, it's okay. I'll let that other business get the customers. They must become more. I must become less. No, it's okay. It's okay if they got the role in the play, in the school play. It's okay. They, they need to become greater. I need to become less. Uh, who does this? Nobody. Uh, 
I'll go ahead and let the guy in front of me in line. Or for those of you, you know, who you travel up from Chicago or anything, oh, no, 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 I'll slow down so that you can get, in, you know, in front of me. <laughs> it doesn't happen. They must become greater. I must become less. And what's really neat is John didn't say they should become greater. He said they must. He, no, I'm sorry, I said they because of the Chicago, but yeah, he must become greater. Jesus must become greater. And that's hard and it hurts. And let me tell you what it meant for John. For John, it meant losing his ministry. He was done. I mean, he would have been baptizing, announcing the coming Messiah. The Messiah is here now. He doesn't need an announcer. His ministry was over. And it wasn't long after that that it led to his beheading by Herod, by King Herod. For Moses, he must become greater, I must become less, meant leading a bunch of whiny people through the desert for 40 years. And then he never even got to enter the promised land. He must become greater, I must become less. For Paul, the Apostle Paul, it meant losing his position as a Pharisee. I mean, Paul was a Pharisee with the notoriety and the respect, all of the people looking up to him as a teacher of the law. He decides to follow Jesus. After, you know, like jailing and killing Christians, he decides to follow Jesus, completely loses his position as a Pharisee, and then he is beaten and shipwrecked and eventually martyred. And what's amazing is that almost every single person who followed Jesus, like when he was here, almost every one of them were martyred. Yet, to each of them, being a part of God's story was worth it. The Apostle Paul says this. He says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ. See, his story is not always about success and health and wealth and getting everything you want. Sometimes following Jesus Sometimes putting him greater than me, making him the star of the story, means it's, it's going to hurt. So how in the world is it worth it? Because it's not, it doesn't end when I die. This is a story that impacts many lives and goes on for eternity. It impacts many people's eternity. See, God's story is, it's the one with purpose. His story, like, like if, you know, for those of you who are in the military, being in the military is, is being a part of something bigger than yourself. We have a friend who's a Navy SEAL. That friend, even today, he's retired. He would give up his life for his buddies. In a heartbeat, because being a part of something greater than himself is so much better and more satisfying and more purposeful than when it's all about me. And God is allowing us to be a part of the grandest story of all time. So if it means temporary suffering we still get to be a part of this meaningful, eternal story. See, my, and what's amazing is my story and your story is only p possible because of these people who went before us and lived their story for God. They chose his story over their own and, and we get the benefit of that because we know Jesus, we've heard of him. His name is not known in all the countries around the world. Why is it known here? Because so many people have chosen his story over their own, and we are the recipients of that. That is beautiful. And we get to be the ones who do the same for the next generation and the next generation until the whole world hears. God's story, it's not easy. Oh, but it is so worth it. It's the best story. And over and over, I want my life to say yes to his story. But it is hard because I want to be the star. I really do. It's part of my human nature, my sin nature. I want the story to be about me. You know, I saw that even this week as I was preparing this message because my story versus God's story, it, it is a constant struggle. And as a speaker, as a preacher, guy who gives messages, whatever, I always want the messages to be fun for both you and me. And at the same time, I want to share life-changing truths, right? That, so that we all leave, including me, a little bit transformed, a little bit more pointed towards the direction of Jesus so that we can just take a couple of steps more towards him. And so the, the question is, what is my main motivation? Being funny or you know, having a good message or sharing truths that change people's lives? 
And of course, when I ask myself, which one is my main motivation, I always want to say, oh yeah, my main motivation is sharing truths that, you know, have the power to change people's lives. But the reality is, sometimes I realize I just want to get a good laugh. And so I put a thing like, genitals on the screen you know and and you're like it's funny was it appropriate i just was sitting here thinking about that <laughs> do i want you to like me and think i'm funny or do i want to share truths that have nothing to do with me but have the power to change all of our lives it's a constant struggle why do i want to impress people so much why do i want people to like me you know, I, I shared last week, why do I allow uh, my value to be measured by my performance? I don't know. It's, it, it's my sin nature. That's my struggle. See, I have to remember also that God is the star because he can only, only he can change our lives. Only he has the power to truly transform us. But it is a long journey, a daily choice to make Jesus center stage. He must become greater. I must become less. I'm joining a story in progress. It's his story. See, my name is I am not. But I know I am. I know I am. He loves us and he's invited us into this huge plan. When we allow ourselves to be his instruments in his story, all of a sudden we realize we become more influential than we ever could have when it was about us. It has nothing to do with our talent. has nothing to do with our performance. It has nothing to do with our abilities. It's all about our availability. To be available for God, to reflect Him in every area of our lives. It's not just what we do. It's what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. It's why we do it. It's the heart. It's the motivation. It really does matter. So whatever God has created you to do, do it so well. Do it with Him in mind. If you're single, date with God in mind. Choose a spouse as part of his story. Serve your family in a way that honors God. Love your coworkers or employees like Jesus would. If you're good at music, make great music for his story. If you fix things, fix them with his purposes in mind. If you make money well, make lots of it for his story and not for yours. See, live your life, your part in the grand story with his name in mind. His story in mind. His name is what? I am. Your name and my name is what? I am not. Allow the freedom of that because that's the story of the Bible. God created. We rejected. God pursued. He provided everything necessary for our restoration. He offers life in him. All we have to do is say, I follow him. I follow I am. I let him have the responsibility of changing other people and doing everything right and it's his responsibility not mine started in the old testament continues in the new testament that when god became one of us died on the cross for our sins rose from the dead and now offers life through his story so the question is as we close today is whose story when you look at the last week the last month last year your whole life whose story has been most important to you Now, every one of us can say, for sure, my own. But has God's story been a part of your life? How about this? How about now? Is his story the one that you're trying to pursue the best? The the little, are you are you living that little temporary local infomercial? Are you part of the grand Academy Award winning epic story of God? It's a daily choice. He invites you to choose his story, to let him in every area of your life. So the question is, will you do that? Will you begin living your life for his story, the great story? Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that you help us see clearly what our motivations are. Some of us in here, we have been trying to follow your story. And of course, we fail all the time but it is a constant pursuit. Help us know and have the discernment and the wisdom to know when we keep reverting back to our own story. But some people in here, they've never followed your story. 
I pray that you give him the courage to, to do that today, to turn and to, to face you and to start taking steps towards your story. And I pray that you change their life. Help them follow Jesus. He must become greater. We must become less. God, help us to continually know that this is your story. Help us to desire you more than we desire ourselves. And give us the courage to change what needs to be changed and to live our lives for you. In your name we pray. Amen.